you know, I, I'm not going to fall into that rhetoric of, oh, I condemn this and I condemn that. And I'm also not going to fall into the whether or not it's justified or not justified. The fact of the matter is Palestinians have been massacred for decades. You have the largest open air prison in the world. Palestinians are denied even the right to have potable water, fresh water to drink. And people are still asking, oh my gosh, October 7th, what about October 6th? What about October 5th? What about October 4th? What about, you just keep going on and on and on. Hi everyone, I'm Marilyn. And I'm Rhea. And you're listening to Who Run the World? podcast where two Arab women and best friends come together to talk about what's on their mind and the mind of their peers today. And today, Razi, I think we all know what's on the mind of our peers and our own minds for the past few weeks. So to frame this, and um, I am using the dominant narrative in the media here, but on October 7th, Hamas led an attack on Israel that killed around 1,400 or now revised to 1,200 Israeli citizens and soldiers. What followed, however, was a collective punishment at a scale unprecedented of the Palestinian people, especially in Gaza, at the hands of the Israeli occupation. At the time of recording, around 12,000 Palestinians have been killed, including an estimated 5,000 children, not to mention the thousands more that have been wounded or displaced. It's been impossible to watch. I think as a parent, I see the face of my daughter in almost every video. And um, the only thing that we can do, especially if you live in the UAE, is share posts and contribute to donations or events around the topic. But we also thought that we could use our podcast as a platform to help amplify Palestinian voices during this time and help create thoughtful conversation amongst our listeners about everything that's been happening. And a couple of weeks ago, I attended um, an event at Cave, uh, an amazing coffee shop here in Dubai at Al Sarkal Avenue, uh, where today's guests spoke about how the events of the past few weeks didn't start on October 7th. They started at least 75 years ago and even way before that. And I listened to her and I thought we have to have her on the podcast to share with us this weirdly often erased history. And so our guest today is Palestinian-American international lawyer, professor, and writer. She's also the co-founder of Diaspora Heartbeat, an online platform dedicated to crafting a space where Palestinian stories flourish, uniting creativity, community, and collaboration. She's also an incredible friend of mine, and I'm so happy she's here today. Please welcome into your ear, Tamara Arim. Hi, Tamara. Thanks for coming on the show today. Hey, ladies. Thanks for having me. Thanks for joining us. Before we get into the the meat of the episode, um, and I know it's been a very tough time for all of us, especially for for Palestinians, we wanted to ask you, how are you doing? How are you holding up? Oh, what a great question. And you know what? I don't have an answer to that. I think Palestinians everywhere uh, are struggling with that question because I don't think a lot of people really know how they feel. I feel a lot of things. Um, Guilt and gratefulness are two really big feelings that I'm going through really guilty that I feel grateful if that makes sense you know to be outside of Palestine to be able to hold my loved ones I have a roof over my head I have fresh water all of that yeah I I can totally relate to that the guilt and gratefulness feel like two sides of the same coin these days and so Tamara we wanted to bring you you know on this episode because you have really extensive knowledge of a lot of different things that everybody deserves to know and understand uh, with more depth. You know, we started this show saying that the the dominant narrative is that things started on October 7th, but things haven't started on October 7th. Some say they started 75 years ago, and maybe there's an earlier start to that. So if we wanted to pinpoint when this starts, what would be your answer? How does it start? I mean, really, it starts, and I'm not going to go all the way back there, but if you want to really know when it starts, it starts probably around the 1700s with the rise of anti-Semitism throughout Europe. 
But as it relates to Palestine specifically and how we get there, I would call that the rise of Zionism, the establishment of Zionism in 1897, where Theodore Herzl, the founder of Zionism, brought together the World Zionist Congress and really brought this idea to the forefront and said, you know what, Jewish populations throughout the world and mainly in Europe had been undergoing some really severe anti-Semitism. You had the pogroms of Russia throughout Britain and France, just really terrible things were happening to Jews. So to sort of combat that, they said, you know what, we really need a safe place for Jewish communities throughout the world. And the idea was to establish a homeland for the Jews, an exclusive homeland for the Jews in Palestine. And I guess one of the key kind of historical events that followed that was the declaration of Balfour. And I know that it was quite striking in how short it was, but also what it contained. Would you like it to read it out loud to our listeners? So just to give you a little context to Balfour Declaration before I actually just delve into it, the Balfour Declaration was a public statement that had been issued by the British in 1917. But the precursor to that was really World War I, and you had Britain and France getting together and ultimately trying to figure out how they were going to colonize the Levant and the Middle East and, and cut it up into little pieces, which ultimately was established through the Sykes-Picot Agreement. As many of your listeners might have heard, the Sykes-Picot Agreement ultimately is what established the nation states of Lebanon, Jordan, Palestine, and Syria, where the French took Lebanon and Syria, and the British colonized uh, Jordan and Palestine. And the, really the idea behind that was to get rid of the Ottoman forces that had been um, colonizing the area. And so what the British did was the Palestinians and the other Arabs in the region said, okay, you know what, we're going to help you gain independence from the Ottomans if you fight with us against them. And so that's exactly what the Arabs did. They fought with the British forces to take the Ottomans out of Palestine. And what the British turned around and did was say, actually, just kidding. We're going to be giving this land to the Zionist forces. And that ultimately culminated in the Balfour Declaration, whereby Lord Balfour had issued this letter to Lord Rothschild. And that was on November 2nd, 1917. So just a few weeks ago um, was the anniversary of that. And it says, Dear Lord Rothschild, I have much pleasure in conveying to you on behalf of His Majesty's government the following declarations of sympathy with Jewish Zionist aspirations, which has been submitted to and approved by the cabinet. His Majesty's government view with favor the establishment in Palestine of a national home for the Jewish people and will use their best endeavors to facilitate the achievement of this object, it being clearly understood that nothing shall be done which may prejudice the civil and religious rights of existing non-Jewish communities in Palestine or the rights and political status enjoyed by Jews in any other country. I should be grateful if you would bring this declaration to the knowledge of the Zionist Federation. Just like that. Just like, Just that. like that. Just like that. Wow. Interesting to note one of those last sentences about it being clearly understood that nothing shall be done which may prejudice the civil and religious rights of existing non-Jewish communities in Palestine, which even though this letter is very, very short, has somehow been forgotten. Not by Palestinians. No. Um, Palestinian children everywhere. And quite frankly, many Palestinian children in refugee camps that barely speak English can actually recite this declaration to you verbatim. That's crazy. You're looking I at me shocked. It's, I'm quite, yeah. You'd be surprised. I mean, it's really interesting how Palestinian children are really raised to be articulate about their rights and history in a way that perhaps other groups under colonization, haven't had to, not because Palestinians are in any way special or different than other colonized people, but because of the really unique scenario that Palestine has been treated under, under I guess, modernity. 
it's almost that they have to, right? Uh, since October 7th or even before October 7th, we've all had to be immaculate in the way we talk about Palestine and Israel and have our all our historical knowledge ready, all our bullet points and arguments ready. Whereas it feels like a lot of, for lack of a better word, Westerners, and even, I will not just Westerners, I will even put myself in this, I didn't know a lot of the history and I didn't know a lot of the argument that I had to put forth. And so I had to educate myself and I'm still educating myself. There's a lot of things that we can cover on this podcast. There's a hundred plus years of colonialism in Palestine and we'd have to do five podcast episodes to get through it all. But what do you think are three key historical moments in the larger hundred plus year narrative of Zionism that people might not know and need to know, in your opinion, to understand what's happening in Palestine? I think most people really know what happened. We have the dates, we tick them off, we say, you know, um, 1948 was the Nekba, 1967 was the next, uh, the first intifada, the second intifada. And, you know, I, I don't know if I would necessarily say that these are the key historical, you know, moments of Zionism, but I would really say that that was the main turning point when the Balfour Declaration uh, was published and sent. Everybody's cards were on the table from colonizer's hand to another colonizer's hand to another colonizer's hand that this is exactly what's happening. And notice the language of the Balfour Declaration. It's not like they're going to come out and say, oh, okay, well, it's the Palestinians that we're not going to be prejudicing. And it's not the Mizrahim Jews the Jewish community that we're not going to be prejudicing, but really it's the existing non-Jewish communities in Palestine, lest they say Palestinian, lest they say Arab, lest they say anything else, because this is a really big talking point for Israelis today, right? That this is a land for a people, for a people without a land. And they just sort of showed up, found a few rocks and some desert, and then we're like, oh, okay, this is going to be our homeland now. So I think it's really important when we're talking about sort of colonialism that that's really where we're focusing um, our attention to. And then you have in 1948, the Nekba, which was the forced displacement and destruction of over 500 Palestinian villages, towns and cities, and over 800,000 Palestinians forced from their homeland and the establishment of the state of Israel. At the time, there was really this push to increase the Jewish population. And the way that that really manifested in terms of the language between 1947, 1948 until 1967, which is the uh, occupation of the West Bank, including East Jerusalem and Gaza, was to include Palestinian citizens of Israel, whereby they were no longer Palestinian citizens of Israel. We would just call them. Arab Israelis, thereby really erasing our Palestinian identity. So even this language, Arab Israeli, was really used for a really long time and is still mistakenly used by some Arabs today to refer to Palestinian citizens of Israel because Israelis, if you really follow their narratives, their media, their, even discussions with you know an average Israeli, Arab good. Palestinian bad. Because when we think of Arab, we're thinking, oh, okay, it's, you know, Abu Hassan, the Hamas shop, or Jordan, or Egypt, who we have a peace treaty with. You know, that's who we're thinking about. But Palestinian? Palestini? No, no, no. Palestini is bad. Palestini is these people that we're carpet bombing in Gaza. And that sort of culminated really in a really interesting way in the first intifada. And at that point, Palestinians throughout the country, but mainly in the West Bank and Gaza, were really fed up of the occupation and they fought back. And, you know, in Tafalda, Arabic for uprising, there was a huge uprising throughout the entire country that really took over. And it started really um, reminding Palestinians of this Palestinian identity that we have to be able to connect to our Palestinian identity in a way whereby the Israeli colonizer would not be able to remove us from. And they had been really successful up until that point, whereby we were criminalized 
Palestinian flags, where criminalized Palestinian songs, a lot of art had been confiscated. I mean, during the first instance of all the prisoners, Palestinian uh, political prisoners had actually been denied the rights of education. So they went on hunger strike just to have access to pencils to be able to continue their education. I mean, that's how intense the criminalization of Palestinians had become. Everything and anything to do with Palestine was a threat to this Zionist nation because with the, these Palestinians, you could never have a fully fledged Zionist country that's Zionist, Jewish only, and democratic at the same time. What are you going to do with 20% of your population? So what you do is you oppress it in every form. That really continued until the second of the Fada. And actually, a lot of people will say, okay, well, the second of the Fada really started, flared up in Jerusalem when Ariel Sharon, you know, making this huge public display of force went into the Al-Aqsa Mosque compound. But really, I argue that the second of the Fada really started in Haifa and Akka and Yaffa and really on the Israeli campuses by Palestinian citizens of Israel who weren't really fighting a human rights battle or an anti-colonial battle, but at the time were really fighting a civil rights battle. You know, they were citizens of the same country, but they didn't have the same rights. So students at Haifa University didn't have the same access to scholarships. They didn't have access to transportation. They didn't have access to dorms. And so they really went, decided, well, okay, everybody else has a student group. Why don't we Arabs have a student group? And they got together and they were like, okay, well, why don't we actually talk about our Palestinian identity in the place of our ancestors, in the place of our grandparents, in the place we are where we are being educated and really armed with this knowledge of how to, quote unquote, handle ourselves in a democracy, right? Because the idea was, oh, well, Arabs aren't ready for democracy. You know, the most racist comments made towards Arabs. And uh, really a, a talking point that I've heard over the years by Israeli pundits is, well, obviously Arabs can't handle democracy. They're not ready for democracy. And it's really been pushed by the Europeans and, and the Americans that we can't handle democracy. Well, lo and behold, these Palestinian citizens of Israel went to the streets of their campuses and that's where really they started protesting. And that trickled down through the rest of Palestine, through all of historical Palestine into the West Bank and then eventually Gaza. That was a really important turning point because Israel had tried really hard to erase Palestinian identity and create a huge disconnect between Arab Israeli on one side and Palestinian on the other side. Arab Israelis being 1948 Arabs, these are the good Arabs. Aravim tovim in Hebrew, you know, like the good Arabs. And then you had the West Bank Arabs. Those are Palestinians. Bad, really bad. They're the ones in Gaza. Again, the ones that we carpet bomb. And so I guess we also can't talk about what happened in October and is still happening without talking about the siege itself. Walk us up to how do we get to a siege? The siege began 16 years ago, but really the attack on Gaza began many years before that. And I think even many Palestinians uh, forget that there was that time uh, in Gaza's history whereby they had really been shut off from the rest of the world. So officially the siege started 16 years ago, but really it was way before that. And what I mean by that is you have this strip of land with about 2 million people. I mean, at the time before the siege, it was probably 1.8 million. Now it's 2.3 in this small, tiny enclave of land. And they had threatened an entire demography that Israel was standing on, which is, okay, well, we have 3 million Palestinians in the West Bank. We have 2 million Palestinians in Gaza and 20% of our population is Palestinian. What do we do? The easiest thing that we can do is actually get rid of these two millions in Gaza. And if we treat them bad enough, perhaps they will just disappear into the sea or disappear into the deserts of Egypt. And so you see the siege happening way before the official air, land, and sea blockade, whereby things had quickly dwindled and, you know, they 
very quickly didn't have access to food all the time. They didn't have access to resources whenever they needed. Access to just trading wasn't the same. Things started becoming more and more difficult for Gazans. And the Oslo Accords were signed in 1993. And the idea was this is an interim agreement whereby by the end of it, it's a five-year period. And after these five years, you're going to have a state of Palestine next to the state of Israel living in peace and security and a lasting peace and whatever uh, that entailed, whether it was an, you know, included uh, security, economic uh, peace, et cetera, et cetera. And in that agreement, there's something that says that, you know, Palestinians will, in Gaza, will be able to fish 20 nautical miles outside of the coast. Well, Palestinians have never actually, under Israeli occupation, been able to fish 20 nautical miles off of our coast. This was right before the the blockade, until they brought it down to one and a half nautical miles. So imagine that. Two million food insecure people now only have a mile and a half off of their tiny little coast to fish to be able to feed their population because once the blockade happened, and we can go into how the blockade happened, but once the blockade happened, Israel began regulating how much food was entering the Gaza Strip. And that was based on a specific calorie count. So Palestinians in Gaza weren't allowed access to more than 2,700 calories per day in this open-air prison as a result of the blockade. And there's nowhere else to get food. I mean, where else are you going to get food other than the sea, right? You're going to fish, you're going to try and get access, and you only have access to one and a half nautical miles. Otherwise, you're going to be shot at. That's pretty, I mean, when I heard that for the first time, I just, I couldn't, I couldn't wrap my head around this. What caused the official blockade? I think Israel just really wanted to use an excuse. But the excuse was, again, Palestinians aren't ready for democracy. At the time, Yasser Arafat, previous chairman and president of uh, the PLO, passed away and Mahmoud Abbas took over. And ultimately, you had a series of PLO shifts and everybody was ready for democratic elections. But of course, you know, Palestinians aren't ready for democracy. So obviously we don't know how to have elections. So what is a PLO for people who might not know what it is? The PLO is the Palestine Liberation Organization. It is the representative body of Palestinians around the world. It was established in 1964. Because Palestinians were never allowed to return to their homeland, the PLO represented the Palestinian interests politically Uh, throughout the world. So that's who the PLO was. Got you. And so the elections that happened, what year, like take us back to that? That was uh, around 2005. And so the election for that was for the PA, the Palestinian Authority. And ultimately the uh, Oslo Accords established the Palestinian Authority. And the Palestinian Authority is the -the on-the-ground government of the Palestinians. So they're the ones that run the Ministry of Health and Transportation and Telecoms. And they're the ones that make sure that, you know, the garbage man comes and picks up the garbage and and things like that, right? The day-to-day on the ground government. So there were the elections and Fatah, the ruling party, was historically very corrupt. And ultimately, Palestinians really got sick of it and voted in the opposing party, the opposing party being Hamas. So Hamas wins the election and Israel, the United States and the EU are like, nope, we're not going to have it. That's We meant democracy, but not that kind of democracy. We told you Arabs weren't ready for democracy and refused to recognize Hamas's legitimacy in the elections. That ended up turning into skirmishes between Fatah and Hamas forces, culminating in Hamas taking over the Gaza Strip and having effective control of Gaza and Fatah having effective control over the West Bank. Ultimately, Israel really used that as an excuse to say, look at what's happening. This is Hamas. And now because they've taken over the Gaza Strip, we need to ensure some sort of order. And as a result, they had completely shut Gaza down. 
And that culminated in the aggressions on Gaza every couple of years or so. And so siege has been going on for 16 years, constant bombing, attacks, restraints on any form of choice, liberty, freedom, all of the values of great democracies. Help us now just bring it back to October 7th. And while all forms of violence on anybody who's innocent and, un and is not at war officially are condemnable, to use the word that the media likes to use, just help us understand how do you get to what happens on October 7th, but also how is the Israeli disproportionate response to that you know, in line with how they've always responded? This is what Israel has been doing to the Palestinians for decades. And this isn't just because of the siege. This isn't anything new. I think the reason why everyone is so shocked and surprised by October 7th was because you had Hamas for the first time in, I think, Palestinian history. I don't think anybody's ever seen this. Strategic, very calculated, very military-like finally break free and get past the apartheid wall and enter Israel and conduct a really intense attack on Israelis. And I think it was that response that had really shocked everyone. I mean, it, Palestinians, everybody was shocked. It wasn't just uh, Israelis and the rest of the world. Everybody was really surprised. One, to know that Hamas even had that kind of arsenal of, of weaponry, but also to see how calculated and strategic that was. So, you know, I, I'm not going to fall into that rhetoric of, oh, I condemn this and I condemn that. And I'm also not going to fall into the whether or not it's justified or not justified. The fact of the matter is Palestinians have been massacred for decades. You have the largest open air prison in the world, Palestinians are denied even the right to have potable water, fresh water to drink. And people are still asking, oh my gosh, October 7th, what about October 6th? What about October 5th? What about October 4th? What about, you just keep going on and on and on. I think what we really need to focus on now is what next for Palestinians? What's the day after going to look like? Because we already know how this is going to end. It's not a pretty picture. We have 12,000 Palestinians and counting in 40 days, half of whom are children. Children, you have a graveyard of children, as the UN stated. So we know how this is going to end. I think what we need to focus on is what next? What happens to Palestine when this is over? And the quote unquote fog of war is lifted and looks through that fog to the future of Palestine. I think part of that is also for everyone to acknowledge and call it what it is a genocide. You call a spade a spade, 12,000 and counting. W what do we need from, from a legal perspective? What's next, right? What, what do we need from the international community? Or do we even need the international community at this point? because uh, they have greatly failed Palestine and the Palestinian people. Yeah, I think I'm also curious about that, because in the last few weeks, there was um, a clip on social media from a UN reporter uh, who responded to some comments and questions from journalists in a really beautiful way, where, you know, she was saying Israel cannot claim self-defense, and the journalist got, you know, offensive or defensive about that. And she said, well, actually, my friend, under international law they can't claim self-defense i'm not being cute here like i'm not this isn't just like english it's international law and i think it would be really helpful i think there are these terms that i'd love you know you're a lawyer and i'd, I'd love to just put some color behind so that we all understand what words we're dealing with so let's start with this can israel say that this is self-defense yes or no and why not yeah i mean the answer is obviously no and I'll tell you why. So basically the the argument that Israel uses that, you know, Israel has the right to defend itself. And we hear that over and over and over again is Article 51 of the UN Charter. 
And that basically says that every peace-loving nation has the right to defend against an armed attack. Okay, so Israel um, defended against a quote-unquote armed attack. But in that same vein, you have the 2004 ICJ advisory opinion on the wall. And the ICJ is the International Court of Justice. This is considered customary international law. Customary international law means that there can be no derogation from it. You know, this is blanket. This is across the board. Nobody can say otherwise. And that this is occupied territory and you protect the people that you occupy. You have to ensure that they have access to healthcare. You ensure that they have access to their own resources. You're not allowed to pillage um, whereby you take the resources out. You can't forcibly displace them from, from their land unless it's for their own safety. So that's sort of, I think, where Israel is going with this is that, yeah, you have all these Hamas fighters, so we're going to invoke Article 51 of the UN Charter, and we're going to forcibly displace these people from their lands for their own safety so that we can attack these, these militants that are, you know, these terrorists that are attacking us. The problem with that is while these people were on their way to safety, they were bombed, and then they were bombed again, and then they were bombed again and again. And, and the people that were trying to actually leave through the border into Egypt, had themselves bombed again. The, the border itself was bombed. So um, all of these arguments under international law and international humanitarian law, which is the law of war, the arguments that are used by Israel are, are all false. There is no, what's happening now obviously is in self-defense. What's happening now is, as uh, Rhea very eloquently said, this is uh, a genocide called spade a spade. So there is no legal right under international law for Israel to defend itself uh, in the manner it is conducting itself on the population of Gaza right now. Okay, so speaking of spades, what does it take to legally qualify this a genocide? I mean, we're looking at the genocide convention. So what is a genocide? Let's, let's start there. The genocide is the eradication or the destruction of a people for based on uh, race or ethnicity. It is very summarized. And the thing that we look at when we look at the genocide convention is something we call special intent. We can't just say, you know, take some Israeli off the street and say, okay, we charge you with genocide because, you know, you went on your um, Facebook, your Instagram, and you said Palestinians uh, should all die. But we're looking at the intent of a national government to destroy people based on race or ethnicity. And we see that when the highest echelon of Israeli government, the Minister of Defense and the Prime Minister and Minister of Finance and everybody calling Palestinians human animals and saying we need to carpet bomb Gaza and we need to eradicate them and, and get rid of them. So really when we're looking at genocide. We're not even looking for the acts. We're looking for the intent. So regardless of whether genocide is actually happening, which it is, we're looking at the intent of the genocide to actually be happening, which obviously when you have the tweets coming out about uh, the hospital bombing and then all of a sudden the hospital's bombed and 500 people are killed and Israel removes the tweet and says, nope, just kidding. It was a misfire by a Hamas rocket. Things like that. There's really enough evidence out there. And, you know, I've seen a lot of cases go to international courts. And I, I could tell you that this is really up there with ICTY, the International Court for former Yugoslavia, the tribunal. The amount of evidence that is accumulating. The only problem is, we aren't the ones with blonde hair and blue eyes. We're not the ones with the power for the rest of the world to look at us and say, oh, we have to really take care of those civilized people. Because remember, Arabs aren't ready for democracy. Only white people are. You're still up against these superpowers. You're still up against the United States backing Israel in such a zealous way, whereby unless the United States finally turns around and says, you know what, actually, Israel, you have gone too far, even for us, 
you're going to have significant, significant pushback by the Israelis to go to the ICC or any other uh, cooperation from any other court around the world. Is there a way for us lay people to apply pressure to have this happen? Or is it just something that we have to watch from our screens? Call your representatives. If you're in the United States, if you're in the UK, if you're in France, or if, you know, you're in a country where that's a thing, call your representatives, drive them nuts. I mean, you'd be surprised how many will actually answer the phone. My sister-in-law was called her rep the other day and she was telling me that um, they actually picked up. I picked up the phone and had a conversation. I mean, it was more of an argument, but had that that back and forth about what's going on. Reps all over the United States, for example, in the UK, I know for a fact are being inundated. And I think that pressure needs to continue because they're elected by people like you, like me, like anybody else, they are elected. And without the support of the people that elect you, you're not going to stay in office for very long. And so when people are upset, really a great outlet is to pick up the phone or email or write a letter and send it in and say, you know, what's going on is not okay and I don't support it and you shouldn't either and not in my name. Anything we can do if we don't live in one of those countries? Don't stop talking about Palestine. That's the number one thing. I think it's really important for us to remember that Palestinians back home are going through a lot, right? They go through it every day and they've been going through it for over 75 years. When we're not in Palestine, we get bogged down by the day to day and we forget or we get exhausted or we have other things going on and, you know, we forget about what's going on in Palestine. They don't forget. They don't have the luxury of forgetting about what's going on on their way to school or on their way to work or sitting in their gardens. They don't have that luxury when they're thinking about how they're going to get access to health care or safety. I think it's going to be a long road, but not one that's impossible. And so that's why I think it's really important not to stop talking about Palestine. And with that, Tamara, we're so grateful that you came on the show during this difficult time to share your knowledge and your perspective. If even one of our listeners comes away from this, knowing more about the history of occupation in Palestine, then, then we've done our job for today. And um, for our listeners, you can follow Tamara's work with Diaspora Heartbeat on Instagram at Diaspora Heartbeat. This is Who Run the World, and I'm Marilyn. And I'm Rhea. And our producer is Ahmed Ashur over in Bahrain. New episodes of Who Run the World drop every two weeks, so make sure to subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts so you don't miss an episode. Until then, take care of yourselves and each other. Bye.